All right, let's see if this is working. Anybody there yet? Cool. So, let's see, we are live, coming from NZ Aerosports headquarters, not in New Zealand, but in the US today. Um, my name is Josiah, I am a skydiving athlete, compete mostly in freestyle, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about how I got here. So, I think the way we're going to do this today is I'm going to share a little bit of my story and uh, kind of talk about what competition is and how I like to prepare for it. And you guys jump in at any time and write questions in the comments and I'll do my best to answer as many of those as possible. So yeah, for any of you guys in the US, happy Thanksgiving tomorrow. Um, and for all of you around the world, I hope you're enjoying warmer weather than we have here. So let's see. Well, we'll jump right in. Um, I got started in skydiving about 10 years ago, uh, and I just did a tandem with a couple of mates, and we had a lot of fun, and I decided I wanted to do it again. So I went through and did AFF, and then started jumping, uh, met some real good friends at the beginning there, had a lot of fun, it's just a bunch of shenanigans. And then about a year and a half into my jumping career, I was approached by an experienced belly flyer to see if I would consider competing on a belly team. And you know, free flying was way cooler to me. But this guy convinced me to do it because he got a couple of my friends to do it with us. And, uh, and so in 2013, we trained eight way, eight way formation skydiving. And, uh, and it was a blast. We had so much fun. We went to nationals that year in Chicago, and we ended up bringing home gold in Intermediate Eight Way. <laughs> and it was a really special, special season. Um, the, the people on that team made that amazing. Um, but from, for what I got out of it was, I, I got the bug to compete, because competition was super rad. And there's nothing like going up there on round one, first thing in the morning, just as the sun's rising, it's cold and you're excited and you don't know how you're gonna do, um, but I loved it. So I got back from that competition and decided I wanted to get better at free flying. Um, I got a membership at the tunnel, Paraclete XP, and started putting in some time there. Um, took some canopy courses, worked on that part of, of skydiving as well. Um, one of my goals has always been to be a real, a real well-rounded flyer. Uh, so that's been kind of something that's important to me. So taking the canopy courses, learning to free fly, and then continue to compete. Uh, in 2015, uh, I started freestyle skydiving. And that was super fun, because uh, it, it didn't combine skydiving with competition. So I flew camera for another flyer, and we went to nationals in Arizona in 2015 and earned a spot on the US team. So then my first uh, world meet was in 2016 in, at Skydive Chicago again for the Mondial there. And that was a great experience. Uh, first world level competition, super fun. Got to meet all my heroes uh, in the sport, hang out with them, see all the countries, and super electrifying being in a, at a world meet like that. Um, yeah, after that, 2016, that team kind of dissolved, and that's when Jason and I paired up and we started Axiom, um, beginning of 2017. So we competed 2017, 18, 19, 20, and 21 as Axiom, and uh, did a bunch of, of freestyle. The goal there was to try to combine some of the European style of flying and bring that over to America, um, and it was great. I went to Australia, did the Eloy World Cup, and then most recently the World Championship in Siberia. So, it was super, super fun. Uh, the last several years, uh, freestyle skydiving has taken up most of my flying. Um, most, of my, most of my jumps have been that. So now I've been in the sport about 10 years, sitting right at about 3,000 jumps and several hundred hours in the tunnel. 
and uh, yeah, that's where I'm at right now. So, do you guys have any questions so far, <laughs> or anything that was interesting, or anything about competition, skydiving, free flying? I think this month, NZA is doing uh, some things on competition skydiving, how to be competition fit. So we'll talk a little bit about what I do to prepare for competition. I think, like most of skydiving, competition is 80% mental. So it's really important to have a strong mental focus and have a strong mental game. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, let's see, someone asked a question, where did the team name Axiom come from? That's a great question. Axiom means a self-evident truth. Um, and that was kind of our goal, was to let the, the flying speak for itself. Uh, that self-evident truth is, is something that's just true. It doesn't have to be named or described like you see it and you know it's true. And we wanted the flying to be something that you could just watch and know that it was, it was true, it was coming from the heart. Uh, so that's where we got Axiom. Yeah. Uh, physically for training, um, jumping and flying in the tunnel is super important to have your skills nice and current. Um, but in combination with that, uh, cross training is super duper important. So I think probably I'm at like about a four to one ratio for how much skydiving training specifically com compared to like cross training. So for every hour that I fly in the tunnel, um, I'm doing four hours at the gym or cycling or running or something like that. Uh, because if we're not, if you're not in really good shape, then it makes everything harder in the sky, in the air. So what exactly does that look like? Um, for me, I do yoga to work on balance, coordination, flexibility, and body awareness. Uh, I do cycling and running for cardio, um, just generalized strength. And then I go to the gym like three or four times a week for specific weight training, uh, working on muscle groups that are usually like a little bit weaker. You know, everybody's body's different. And for different types of flying, you need different muscles. Um, so for me, having strong back muscles for certain parts of layouts and stuff and free flying is, uh, is an area that I like to focus on at the gym so that when I need those muscles in the tunnel, I've got them right there. As far as the mental part goes, visualization is huge. You, know, you gotta visualize how you're gonna compete. Um, and every training jump should be visualized like it's a competition. So uh, that means the whole plane ride up from takeoff all the way up to altitude, I'm thinking about what's this jump look like, getting in the mindset, visualizing what it looks like. Um, and also visualizing, you know, how I'm gonna feel that day of competition. Uh, if you compete, if you train like you're in competition, when you get to competition, it's not new. It's not, um, it's not different. It's like you've already been through it a million times throughout the season. Um, let's see, how do you balance everyday life with training and competing and skydiving? That's a great question. I don't balance it at all. Um, I have no life. Uh, I work eight to five and then I train the rest of the time. Uh, there's balances. Balance is really hard when you're trying to do something really well. So uh, you can have work-life balance. Um, that's, I think that's somewhat of an illusion if you're trying to do everything really well. You can only do so much, there's only so many hours in the day. Uh, usually on Mondays, I would go to work all day and then after work, drive directly to the tunnel, fly in the tunnel for an hour, go back to work on Tuesday. Tuesday evening would be either cycling or yoga. Then Wednesday, back at work. And then in the evening, fly another hour in the tunnel. Thursday was the gym and probably a run or something like that. And then Friday was a bunch of jumps, you know, 12, jumps or so and then hit the gym after that and then Saturday was more jumps and then Sunday was oftentimes jumps and then a, and then take a break have a little bit of rest rest is super important that's something I learned this year more than any other year like burnout is real and you gotta you gotta protect your rest time let's see someone asked a question what was that how did the Russian world meet compare to the other ones you competed at it was different it was certainly different I think the, the way the Russian Federation did it by splitting up all the uh, the events. So there was week one that had a bunch of events and then week two, but those competitors weren't allowed to overlap because of the COVID restrictions. Um, so it was a weird, it was a weird vibe not having all the competitors from all the countries there. Uh, I was in week two for artistic and 
uh, it, it seemed kind of like a ghost town. There weren't a lot of people there. It was very small. It's it kind of fun in some ways. Like you spend a lot more time with the same people, um, but I, you missed the, kind of the energy. Uh, the weather was amazing that second week. It was great. Um, Russia did a good job. They put on a good a good meet. Yeah, mentally, I think that was probably one of the hardest meets I've done, uh, just for the the mental preparation. Physically, like totally totally in shape and ready and stuff, but, but the mental game was especially challenging on this last meet. Yeah. Who was your favorite dynamic teammate in the tunnel? That would be, <laughs> as a throwback to, um, to 2015. 2015 was before Jason and I teamed up with Axiom. And, uh, and at the end, I think it was between December and New Year, we did a week at the tunnel. And so at XP, the, the tunnel that we train at, they allow you to buy like a membership for the week where you'll fly every day. And so me and three other guys got together and we all bought memberships for that week and we all split the time. So we were flying an hour a day for seven days. Um, it was an incredible deal. And that was with me, uh, Chris Noonan, Austin Jamison and Jason. And we had the best time. We flew so much every day and we laughed so much. Uh, and we, we, did, we had a great time. So that, that, was, that was really good. Uh, and that was the first time that I had really flown with Jason. And I think after that, that kind of started the, the ball rolling for a year and a half later when we, we started with Axiom. Chris Noonan and I competed later that year in the tunnel in 2A Dynamic with uh, speed rounds and a free routine. So that was super fun. Yeah. Shout out to Chris there. Why aren't you back in the sky, man? All right. Um, let's see what other questions we got talked a little bit about the physical training. We've talked a little bit about the mental training. Um, I think like any kind of training, uh, diet is super important as well. So um, making sure you eat what's healthy to stay fit. I mean, that's, that's somewhat self-explanatory, but I think everybody's body is different in terms of nutritional requirements. So, um, so make sure that, that you're paying attention to your body, to what it feels like for whatever food you put into it. Um, for me, I kept like a kind of a logbook of what I was eating and how I felt. And then I would go back and kind of look, oh yeah, I always felt good when I ate those things or I didn't feel good when I ate those things. And then I kind of tapered my diet to kind of fit those, what I, what I wanted. So when I would go into a world meet, <laughs> I controlled my diet really specifically because I wanted to feel good for every jump. Um, and if you don't feel good, you're not going to fly as well. Let's see. JP asks, were you a natural? How do you overcome those moments of self-doubt, discouraging thoughts in the sport? You know, is anybody a natural at fly, like falling out of the sky? I don't think so. I think there are some things that make people a little bit better at it than others. Uh, but most of it comes down to hard work. Like, you got to put in the work, you got to put in the time. Um, I was never athletic in high school or college. Like, I did a little bit of sports, but I wasn't very good at them. Um, I think everybody has moments of self-doubt and discouraging, especially if you compete, because um, if you're not winning, you're often thinking that you're doing something wrong or you need to do better. Um, in my experience, not winning is probably one of the best things that can happen because you get to learn a lot about yourself when you don't win. Um, if you win, you can pat yourself on the back and you say, hey, I did it. That means my training plan worked. That means everything that I put in like did the best. Like I figured it out. Um, but if you don't win, it makes you learn a lot about yourself. It makes you reflect, what did I do wrong? What could I do better? What does this mean? It makes you question a lot of those things. So every time we got a gold medal, it was really easy to move on and just be excited. But every time I got a silver medal, um, that caused a lot of reflection and a lot of growth. Um, I think silver is probably one of the hardest medals to earn because you're so close to gold, but it's also one of the sweetest because you learn so much about yourself in the process of getting a silver medal than you ever do when you get gold. Um, and then bronze is just pure fun because you're up there on the podium. Uh, I think the silver medal that we earned at this last world meet is probably the medal that I'm most proud of for, for what I learned in that season getting, leading up to it. See, Matt says, how did you balance canopy progression with body flight skills? Do you, do you focus solely on one or both at the same time? Great question. Uh, I think canopy progression is probably one of the most important things in this sport. Um, that's how people die is under their canopy, under usually under a fully inflated functioning canopy. So um, one of my goals was to swoop because swooping is cool. 
So when we got back from nationals in 2013, I set aside the next year to just focus on canopy stuff. And I probably took probably close to 15 canopy courses, canopy course days, like 15 days of canopy course training throughout the, the next year with Greg Windmiller, who was my canopy coach, um, just focusing on the fundamentals, on the basics. And throughout that time, probably, I don't know, three or 400 hop and pops that year. Um, yeah, I downsized and progressed in my canopy progression, but most importantly, like I learned how to fly a canopy safely and consistently. So yeah, I also did tunnel flying during the week and, you know, tried to progress free flying skills, body flight during that time. But I think, I think putting that at the beginning of my skydiving career, you know, in the first couple of years was super critical to have that foundation so that then I could have the freedom to go work on all the other stuff. Um, and know that I was going to be a safe and competent canopy pilot the whole way through. Yeah. So if you're if you're questioning between body flight skills and canopy, like don't give up the canopy. Like that is that is important. That's how you stay safe. Um, and once you have those skills, then the rest of the sport really opens up to you. Uh, but don't <laughs> don't try to skimp on this canopy stuff. Yeah. Let's see. Any other questions? Lauren says, competing at this level must require some level of perfectionism. As a perfectionist, what's it like to open yourself to subjective judging? That's a good question. Um, my personality type, yeah, I want perfection every time. <laughs> um, and in artistic, uh, subjective judging is probably the bane of our existence. You know? Uh, that's the way it is in artistic. That's the way it is in artistic in other sports like gymnastics or ice skating or diving, stuff like that. Um, it's not like closing a point on a block and, and, or getting a bust. It's not black and white like that. So watching the judges score things and not really understanding what they're looking at or why one score is better than the other can be really frustrating. Um, but at some point you have to you have to let it go. Cause if you start chasing, getting that perfect score, you're going to be, you're going to be flying for the wrong reasons. Um, and there were a couple of years that, uh, that I went down that rabbit hole, really trying to, to give the judges what they wanted. Um, and that's important in competition cause you don't want to totally mess it up and give them something that they don't want. But, but really at the end of the day, when you're doing 400 jumps a year, like you have to fly the way you want to fly. Um, because if you don't, and then you don't win, you're going to feel like that whole year was a waste. But if you flew the way you wanted to fly and the, the way that got you the most joy, then you see if the judges like it. And if the judges like it, then that's great. And if they don't, you still got 400 jumps flying the way you wanted to. So that's a, that's a gift there too. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Judging in artistic is, <laughs> is frustrating for sure. Uh, I think that goes for artistic and freestyle and the canopy stuff as well. Definitely in free fall. Um, but it's also rewarding because you're not locked into doing certain formations. You know, you fly the way, you, know, you have a blank canvas, you can fly however you want. I know that people in the tunnel doing artistic stuff also feel this frustration. And the judges are really receptive to trying to understand better what flying is, what's difficult, what's easy. Um, and it's definitely an evolving sport with how flyers fly and it's evolving on the judges side too with how they understand and how they score things. Um, the cool thing about the artistic community is the judges typically have a really good um, relationship with the competitors and so they're very open to communicating and learning and talking and, and feedback going both ways. So Chris says, how do you support your skydiving career? Are you full-time in the industry? I'm not full-time in the industry. I have a full-time job that I work at and that pays most of the bills with skydiving. We also have a ton of support from sponsors. Uh, NZ Aerosports has been sponsoring me for the last six years, I think. Um, they're awesome. I love their wings. <laughs> I got my first Leia 2015, I think. I think it was 15. Yeah, and it was awesome. I fell in love with that canopy. I've been flying them ever since. Um, so get a bunch of support from NZ Aerosports. Paraclete XP is probably the next biggest uh, sponsor and they sponsor jumps and wind tunnel. Uh, best tunnel in America, for sure, hands down. Love those guys. Um, and then UPT and Tonefly, also a sponsor. So um, that, that really takes some of the burden off. Um, the, biggest, uh, the biggest 
commitment that you give when you're competing is time. Um, you know, the sponsors really help out with equipment and stuff, but you're giving up a lot of time, days and days and hours and hours of travel and sitting at the drop zone when the weather's bad or sitting in the antechamber in the tunnel. Um, you're giving up your time to compete at a high level and you gotta understand what your time is worth and you gotta be doing it because you love it. So yeah, sponsors help for sure. Could not do it without them. Um, but even if you had all the sponsorship in the world, like time is finite and you gotta make sure that you're spending your time where you want to. Cool, we got a bunch of other people joining. What other questions you guys have? Ask anything, skydiving, free fly, freestyle, um, canopy, stuff, wings, training. Any thoughts? The dogs downstairs are making a lot of noise. Sorry about that, I don't know if you can hear it. They're running around like crazy. <laughs> Let's see, any other questions that I missed going up here? We talked about aggression. Um, aggression world meet. Would you ever compete in a different event like swooping? You know, I wanted to compete in swooping. I thought swooping was so cool when I started learning it. Uh, I really, I thought that would be the, the coolest thing to do. Um, I might get back to it, maybe. I like canopy flight. I like canopy flight a lot. Some of my favorite jumps have been big way, high pull stuff uh, with canopy formation flying. Some of the hop and flock stuff that uh, they were doing down in Sebastian a few years ago. I don't know if I'll compete in it because I hear it's really hard on your body. Uh, the few people that I know well in that space, um, it just, it's tearing up their bodies. So I'm getting older and I don't know if I want to put my body through that, but it looks super rad. JP says, what's next for me in the sport? Um, I don't know, I'm still figuring that out. Uh, it's been a really good 10 years and I'm curious what the next 10 years will bring. Definitely want to pursue something that I'm passionate about um, and definitely want to, want to understand kind of what I'm looking for um, before diving hard into something. Yeah. Edgy says, are you going to European Skydiving Symposium in Poland? I have no plans to right now. Um, I may be over in Europe during that time next year, so maybe. Uh, I hope to stop by Fly Spot later, later on next year for a bit. Jen says, why freestyle? Um, freestyle is fun because it's open. You can do whatever you want. Uh, there's, you don't have to fly on your belly. You can fly on your back, on your head, head up, head down. Um, it's... it's endless. Uh, if you like free flying, then freestyle is a great way to fly dynamically and statically and do all sorts of things. Uh, there's, there's no limits there. You're limited only by your creativity. So that's super fun. And then two ways are the best flying. If, if you haven't done a lot of two ways, I encourage you to go do two ways with people. Um, because that is the only time that you can let loose a hundred percent in the sky. If you've got three, four people, you know, you're always catering to one or the other. With just two people, you can fly around as hard as you want. You can go crazy because you're only flying against one other person. Um, and if they're going 100% and you're going 100% and you can do that safely, there's no better type of skydiving in the world. Yeah. Let's see, Lauren says, most memorable skydiving experience. That's hard. There have been a lot of good memories over the years. A lot of good memories. Um, the 2013 eight-way team was a really special season. Uh, and again, that's mostly because of the people on that team. That was, that was really cool. Um, I remember taking a wingsuit course down in Florida one time. That was a really, <laughs> a really fun weekend. Um, there've been some canopy camps, uh, staying at Greg Windmiller's house with Logan and Ross that <laughs> were awesome. Um, almost every competition, 2017, Paris Valley with an Airbnb with a bunch of people from Skydive Carolina. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, when I think back about the best memories in the sports, the, in the sport, it's always been on the ground with other people. Um, some, there's some cool jumps for sure. Got some pictures of some really rad stuff we did in the sky. Uh, but the part that I remember the most is the time on the ground spent with people. The sport brings together people that would never cross paths any other way. Uh, and I think that's one of the 
the strengths of the sport. So my advice would be to enjoy the people that you're with, find the good people that you really connect with and, uh, and spend time with them because that's what people are, what it's all about. And, you know, we come together because of a shared passion for falling from the sky. Um, but it's the, it's the memories with the people on the ground that are, that are probably going to stick with you for most of your life. Best advice for new people coming up um, or beginners wanting to start competing. Let's break that down. First of all, answer Matt's question about best advice for new people up and coming. Um, I'd say enjoy the journey and figure out what you're passionate about. You know, skydiving includes so many things, canopy flight, free fall, wingsuit, um, crew, within free fall, there's formation skydiving, vertical stuff, um, artistic, speed. Figure, figure out what you're really passionate about in the first few years and then go for it. Um, and make sure that you're having fun. If you're doing it and you don't enjoy it, <laughs> find something else to do. This sport requires so much from us, so much time, so much money, so much energy. Um, and it doesn't give back a whole lot. Um, but one of the biggest gifts it gives back is, is enjoying your time. So make sure that you're always enjoying your time. Um, alongside that, something that I can't harp on enough. And this goes for everybody, but the best, the, the most important thing, if you want to start competing or if you want to just progress in the sport is find really excellent coaching and mentors. Um, there's a lot of people out there that know a few things, but there's a lot of people out there that know a lot of things. And if you pick your mentors and your coaches wisely, like that will progress you in the sport so much quicker. Um, pay for coaching, whether that's in canopy flight or body flight or whatever. Um, spend the money to pay for coaching because you'll you'll progress so much quicker. But get coaching from the right people. Uh, I remember I won't mention any names, but I remember one coach that I had um, that taught me a bunch of things. Uh, but I actually had to a few years later go back and unlearn those habits because um, he just wasn't a wasn't a great coach. And I knew he was doing the best that he could at the time. Um, but then when I got to a much higher level coach, we had to actually go unlearn habits and unlearning habits takes forever. So better to just get a really good coach the first time, learn it the right way, right from the beginning. Um, so that then you have a really solid foundation going forward. Yeah. Yeah. This coach used to, <laughs> when I was learning to sit fly, um, if you like stood up while you're trying to sit fly, he would punch, punch you in the nuts. Um, funny guy he had some really good things that he coached and taught as well but but um but he he also gave me some bad habits <laughs> so try to avoid that if you can let's see what else we got scott says tandems i don't know what that means um Ella says when you are new how do you identify good mentors that's a good question um at first you won't at first you're just going to find anyone who you can learn from and I think that's like life. You know, you just start drinking out of a fire hose and absorbing whatever you can and kind of seeing what works and what doesn't. Uh, definitely look at who these people are in the sport. And if they've got 100 jumps and they're giving you advice, maybe listen to someone that has a few more jumps. Or if, or if they're the most experienced person at your drop zone, then, then that's what you got to listen to right then. And that's okay. Uh, but always be listening, always be learning um, and comparing what some people say to other people and ask good questions. Um, you know, these days with social media presence, you can always check people out and see kind of what they're doing, see how they're flying. Um, there's no one right way to fly. Um, when you want to fly a certain way, go find flyers that fly that way and then learn from them. Um, you could always look at someone's flying and say, that's really cool, but I don't want to fly like that. Okay. Then don't learn from them. You look at someone's flying and say, that's, that's what I want. Uh, and then you go, you go find them. Um, being in the U.S., uh, there weren't a lot of people that were flying freestyle the way that we wanted to. So we had to go to Europe to kind of figure out how to fly kind of that way. So again, just look up and see um, see who you admire on social media. Watch their flying videos. And if you find someone you want to fly like, then, then go fly. What's up, Dan? My NED buddy. Yeah. Um, for canopy stuff, Flight One puts out a really great program. Uh, there's uh, there are a bunch of good canopy coaches out there, um, and then tunnel stuff. Go to a, go learn from a tunnel instructor. Like you shouldn't be learning body flight in the sky. 
Um, there are things that you have to learn in the sky, like exits, um, looking across formations, stuff like that. But for basic body flight, definitely do it in the tunnel. It's way more cost efficient, way more time efficient. Yeah. All right, what other questions we got? You guys having fun? Let's see, it's four o'clock. Yeah. It's weird, you guys can see me, but I can't see you. This is, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, okay, going back to some of the competition preparation stuff. Um, I like to think about competition as kind of like two phases. There's the, or three phases actually, there's the phase in the winter where you're just trying to stay in shape and not lose all the muscles you built during the season. Cause at least for me, it's too cold here to jump during the winter. Um, so it's just training to stay fit, stay in shape. I'll go to the gym a lot in the winter cause there's nothing else to do. And then during the first part of the season, you really, you train, you train hard, um, you focus, but then about a month, a month and a half before competition, that's when it goes up to like overdrive. And that is like every single jump you consider a competition jump. You make sure you're super focused, well rested, eating right, exercising healthy, all that stuff. Um, so that that way when you get to competition, you're on autopilot. You don't have to shift into a different mentality for competition. You've been training that the six weeks leading up to it. So that's kind of how I think about training um, and making sure that you stay physically shaped and mentally in shape so that that way competition is easy. Um, the goal in competition is always against yourself. You want to fly the very best that you're capable of. You don't want to go up on around and say, oh yeah, I flew about 80% of what I could do. You want to fly the best. So you're competing against how you've trained the whole year. Um, you can always remember those couple jumps throughout the year that were like perfect. Like it just went so well. Like that's what you want in competition. So you're competing against yourself from your very best jumps in training to do those things again in competition. That's how I like to think about it at least. Elliot says, what is your mental process on the plane ride up before a competition round? What is your mental process? So for me, my mental process on takeoff is to close my eyes and visualize the jump once. Just right as the plane's taken off, get right into the mode. And then for the next 10 minutes or so, I usually just try to focus and center on my body, do some breath work. Um, sometimes visualize the jump in freestyle because I'm a performer, I visualize it from my perspective, but then I also visualize it from the camera's perspective because that's how I look at all my jumps afterward is from an outside perspective. So I walk through it both ways from what I'm supposed to see and then also from what is being seen from the other side. For example, like when I do a flip twist, I don't really know what that looks like from my perspective. Everything's just blurry. Um, but I can think about what it would look like from the outside and be like, okay, during that flip twist, I need to point my toes. Because in my mind, when I envision it, from the outside, my toes aren't pointed there, so I need to think about pointing the toes. Stupid rule, but this is what we visualize. Um, then about five minutes before we're gonna get out, um, I run through the jump two more times in my head, kind of in real time, this, then this, then this. Um, and then the rest of it is just kind of being on autopilot. Like stay focused, stay in the moment. Um, that's one of the cool things about skydiving. It's like you, you really get a chance to stay in the moment and stay in your body. And there's not a lot of other things in life that, that kind of get you there. So just stay present, stay focused, stay in the moment. And then as soon as you leave the step, you leave it all out there in the sky. Um, Lauren says, what brought you into the sport? Why skydiving? That's a good question. Um, 2011, I had a lot going on in life and me and three other friends from dental school uh, did a tandem together. Uh, and it was supposed to be a one and done thing, you know, check it off the bucket list and move on. Um, and for two of them, it was, but me and my buddy Tyler were like, that was cool, let's do that again. Well, Tyler got married and had a bunch of kids, so he, he fell away pretty quickly, but I continued on with it. Um, and for me, it was, it was a pretty good escape from things that I was kind of dealing with in my life at that time. It was really nice to just get in the car and on the weekend drive away to the drop zone and spend time there away from the world and away from my problems and just be present and be in the sky and, and get that adrenaline rush because, you know, the first 50 jumps, <laughs> there's no better feeling. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. 
Yeah. Chris says, what's your training like building up to the comp right before the comp day to ease off training as competition day gets closer? That's a good question. So yes, yes, usually, so usually we do like 12 or so jumps per day, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, 36 jumps in a weekend. And we'll do that building up to competition. And then usually the week, the weekend or two weekends before we drop it down to like seven or eight jumps and try to take those a little bit slower because competition pace is slower than just, you know, bang it out 12 back to backs. So we try to get into more of a competition pace, which is slower and really focuses on keeping the mental focus and the mental energy the whole way up. And then usually the week before competition, no jumps. Uh, you want to go into competition hungry for jumps. If you've just done 50 jumps the week before competition, you're tired of jumping, you're tired physically, um, and you're not there. So something I learned from the Golden Knights uh, was that you always want to be hungry, hungry for competition. So kind of tapering it back and to the point where you're like, man, I kind of missed this. I want to get back in the sky. I want to jump. Then we always go out and do just two or three jumps the day before at the competition site, kind of warm up, go through each round, get the jitters out. Um, but again, just very light jump numbers so that that way you're not burnt out from jumping at all. Um, Jen says, what's your debrief process when in competition? Any advice on what to focus on? In competition, there's not a lot of debriefing that happens because once that round is done, it's done. There's no point in going back and looking at it. Um, you want to make sure that you're just focused on the next round. Debriefing during training is super important. Uh, Jason and I would watch videos um, and then kind of write off. We'd both have kind of a, a paper with one side with my side and one side with his side. And we kind of say, okay, for this move, I need to think about this. And he would say, for this move, I need to think about that. And we kind of keep track of, of our own mental process for what to do on each move that we need to improve on. Uh, but during competition, there's not a lot of debriefing about the flying or about the moves. Uh, the debriefing is more kind of like, how do you feel? You know, what do I need to do right now? Do I need food? Do I need rest? Do I need water? What, what's going to set me up to do the very best job on the next jump? Because you don't really look behind in competition. Um, it's fun at the end to watch the, all the rounds again. But for competition, you really, you're only looking forward the next round. What's the next round? What do I need to do to do my very best on the next round? Yeah, you guys are asking some really good questions. I hope to see more competitors out there all of this competition stuff. This is good. What else you got? Mm. Just curious where people are from and what kind of jumping you do. I see a bunch of names on here that I don't recognize. So if you got time and you just want to chat like where you're tuning in from and what kind of skydiving you like to do, I'd be super keen to to hear what that is. We know a couple people in this list and a couple of new names as well. So, Jen says, have you ever had to pull out of competition? Um, no, not had to pull out of competition. Um, like, I, I guess the question is like starting in competition, getting a couple rounds in and then having to pull out. Um, that hasn't had to happen yet think in some ways having a two-person team is, is good there. You're not trying to deal with eight or nine people. Um, that something could happen too. But uh, I've not had to pull out of a competition yet. Chris says, favorite team to compete against? I think one of the most fun teams that I've ever competed against was the French team in 2018, which was Loïc and Pierre from France. Um, and those guys were funny, just some awesome energy, uh, some great laughs, uh, and, and they, they were really fun to compete against. Um, throughout my skydiving career, I've always looked up to Johan Abi, and competing against him has been a really good experience as well. Um, I respect him and admire him as a flyer and as a person a lot. So that's, that's been a very worthy competitor. Um, but Louis and Pierre have probably been the most fun team to compete against for sure. Lauren says, describe your process for developing a routine. Does a routine change throughout the season? Would you ever make last minute changes? Ooh, good question. Um, 
The process for developing a routine. So at the beginning of the season, we're just playing around with ideas. You know, maybe you see a move in the tunnel or you try something out that's kind of fun and you're like, how could we, how could we do this? And this takes two people. So I talk, I think about what do I need to do to create the move? And in the camera, Jason thinks about what do I need to do to present this move in the most exciting and engaging way possible? So usually at the beginning, you're just kind of piecing together a couple of moves here and there and, you know, trying something for 10 jumps or so. And it's like, yeah, that has potential or no, that doesn't, we need to cut that and move on. Um, so that's the first part of the season. And then probably about halfway into the season, we've got the, the list of moves that we want to do. Um, sometimes the order changes a little bit and sometimes the moves tweak a little bit, but it's kind of like, this is what we're going to do for exit. Then it's going to go into this move and then this move, whatever. And then usually about a month before competition, we say, that's it, no more changes um, because we want to just polish it. And so usually the last 50 or 60 jumps are just the exact same thing over and over again, trying to get it as polished as possible. That's ideal. Now, invariably, every single year, we've had to make some last minute changes, usually a week or two before. Um, and usually it comes down to cutting out a move that had so much potential, but just wasn't working um, and swapping it out for a much simpler move. So that's kind of, that's the way that we choose to do it. Um, have a really cool move and it's hard and it's complicated, but we think we're going to get it. You know, we've got 60 more jumps to polish this routine. And then by the last 10, you're like, oh shit, this is not going to happen. <laughs> like at least not this year, maybe next year. Okay. What move can we swap in that still has the same setup and kind of the same ending that's going to fly for sure every single time. So yeah, we try not to make many changes the last month or so, but sometimes little tweaks have to be made. Julie says, what's your ideal jump versus tunnel training schedule? And the tunnel is so crucial to flying. Um, so I think ideally tunnel a lot through the winter and then jump a lot in the summer. Um, tunnel is really important for developing new moves and kind of even once the moves have been decided on, just going in the tunnel and training them so you don't have to waste jumps training the move itself. Jumps kind of are reserved for proximity, working on getting in and out of the move, making sure we stay in close together during the move um, because you can't really practice that in the tunnel. It's very artificial having the walls there. Now, Paraclete, best tunnel in the US, huge tunnel. Like we can actually fly some of the moves together in the tunnel, but it's still artificial because the glass is keeping us in good proxy. So, the things that you cannot train in the tunnel are the exit and proximity flying. So those are the things that you really focus on in the sky and then everything else you focus on in the tunnel. Like I mean, you can do 60 minutes of tunnel in a day. You can't do 60 jumps in a day. Like no matter how many back to back loads you're on and how many packers you got, it's not going to happen. So tunnel allows for way more efficient body flight training. And then the sky is where you work together as a team and flying in relation to each other. Um, I think ideally, Ideal world, if I didn't have a real job, I'd say probably 100 hours and 500 jumps a year would probably be like perfect. But there's <laughs> there's no way to do that with, <laughs> with my job. <laughs> Let's see what else we got. Elliot says, do you ever tunnel train with rigs on for freestyle? Yes. Um, tried that a couple of years ago. UPT makes a really sweet tunnel rig that's almost identical to my skydiving rig. Um, and I flew it in the tunnel a fair bit. Um, it was weird. It was, it was really weird. I tried it. There were a couple moves that it was really helpful on, um, and a couple moves where it just got in the way. So I haven't done that a lot in the last year, year and a half or so, um, but definitely there's a place for it for certain moves and certain body positions and body orientations. Yeah. What else you guys got? Stone, Nick, Orchard, Raymond, Tim, Dom, what's up, Julie, Dom, Jen, nice to see some familiar names on here. Yeah. Well, if you guys don't have any other questions, um, I'm happy to, to answer anything you got, but I also don't want to waste your time. I know in the U.S. at least tomorrow's Thanksgiving and a lot of people are getting food stuff ready. So, oh, Chris says, hey, 
What's up, Chris? That was also a fun team. Uh, Chris and Ed from the UK were a super fun team to compete against. Uh, JP Brown asks, sunrise load a competition or sunset load with friends? Oh, that's not fair. That is such a hard question. I think, I think the sunrise load in 2013 at Skydive Chicago, where there was still frost on the ground, and we were bundled up with blankets in the airplane. Like, I'll never forget that jump. Uh, actually, we had to ride the plane down because a bunch of clouds came in. But like that sunrise taking off was super good. At the same time though, the sunset jumps with a bunch of friends, usually a tracking dive, can't beat it. And the swoop out of the pond at the end, yeah, for sure. And I like to sleep in anyway, so I'm gonna go with sunset load with friends, absolutely. All right, well, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, and thanks New Zealand Aerosports for sponsoring this. Um, they make the best wings and have a fucking awesome time flying with them. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Um, usually Facebook Messenger is the best or drop me a DM somewhere. Uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. I'm happy to encourage, inspire, and answer any of your questions. Uh, this sport has given me a lot and I want to give back as much as I can. So thank you guys. Fly safe, be safe, take canopy courses. We don't need anyone else getting hurt. Um, and to everybody in the U.S., happy Thanksgiving, and we'll check back in later. All right. Have a good one, guys. Be safe.